Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the celebration of some very successful community engagement programs. I'm Helen Blowers, Executive Director of Member Relations here at OCLC, and I'm so pleased to have been on the team to help organize today's event and to have worked with our elected OCLC member leaders who selected the three winning library programs. We're here today to honor the three libraries who won the OCLC Community Engagement Award. Their programs were selected from over 120 submitted by libraries across 41 United States and three countries. Joining me in our studio today, and appropriately socially distanced, is Skip Pritchard, OCLC's President and Chief Executive Officer. Skip is going to start us off with some thoughts about community engagement and then lead a discussion with our winners. We're joined online today by those winners, Tony Oregno, Instructional Designer with Orange County Library System in Florida, Sarah Tassett, the Director at the Jacksonville District Library System in Jacksonville, Michigan, and finally, Elaine Jones, Manager of Youth Services for Edmonton Public Library in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. When we opened the submissions for the Community Engagement Award in February back at PLA in Nashville, our plan really was to celebrate and honor the winners in person. We had envisioned having celebrations at the winning libraries with staff and the community members who helped make the program so successful. And we planned on showcasing those programs at our booth at ALA Annual. Obviously, like so many other events this past year, these plans, well, had to be heavily adjusted. But we are so glad that our winning libraries can be here with us today virtually using the same technology that I know many of you are using to stay engaged with your communities. So how do you even judge and evaluate over 120 programs, all of them doing great work that serve such different communities of such different sizes and in so many different ways? Our team and the committee of member libraries who selected the winners truly wish that we could highlight every program and everything that public libraries do every day. Because quite honestly, they're really inspiring. Reading all these entries that have, has been a real thrill for us. And as you can see from some of the other programs highlighted on the screen, there's a lot of great engagement going on in public libraries. To jumpstart our conversation, I'm again pleased to introduce Skip Pritchard, OCLC's president and CC CEO, who will talk a little bit about how we defined community engagement for this program, and then we'll hear from the winners themselves, who will share with us some details about their award-winning community engagement programs. Skip. Thank you, Helen. So thank you to all, first of all, of our member leaders and all the OCLC associates who work to bring together this event today. And of course, we welcome all of our winners. And for those of you who like these virtual presentations, I'm sure you enjoy this one, but I personally miss that in-person connection that Helen was talking about. But as Helen said, our main goal with this program is to shine a light on the work of libraries because libraries are doing some amazing things. It is so exciting and so uh, rejuvenating, even in the midst of some difficult times, to see some of the great work that you're doing because it has been a tough year. I think we all know that for so many reasons. And yet, in a recent town hall that I gave here at OCLC, I said, you know, OCLC and libraries are filled with what I call no matter what people. No matter what people. They're, they're people who aren't deterred by excuses. People who aren't deterred by barriers. No matter what people are people who just keep doing things no matter what. They do the hard things no matter what. No matter what people don't answer hard questions with, you can't. Or you know this one, uh, we've done it that way before. Or it's so hard. Or why bother, right? No matter what people are people who say, we're going to do this no matter what. No matter what libraries are the ones that say, our community needs this and we're going to do it no matter what. Whatever barrier, whatever things happens, whether it's budget, whether someone's sick, no matter what they think, they think we're going to do this, we're going to meet our goal no matter what. And this Community Engagement Award is really looking at libraries that figure out the best ways to reach their community no matter what. And hopefully, they identify some best practices that all of us can learn from 
individually and collectively. So of course, OCLC has been working with public libraries for a very long time. That's not news to anyone. So cataloging, discovery, resource sharing, all those things. And we're really pleased at some of the ways that we're looking to uh, reach public libraries now, whether it's with our Realm project and helping libraries reopen, or whether it is with Web Junction. In fact, uh, we've had more librarians take Web Junction training classes in a single month than all of last year combined. So it is really amazing and exciting. And of course, we have our first chair. My boss is the city librarian of the city of Los Angeles, John Zabo. He is uh, always talking about what can we do for public libraries. And one of the things that we launched recently is OCLC Wise. And it's a completely new system, which is pretty cool because instead of being designed around the book or the materials, it was designed and orchestrated around the person. And that's what we see you doing is you're, you're not engaged around the materials, you're engaged with your community and you're looking way, for ways to serve. And we're gonna continue to look for ways to serve you in different ways in coming years. So as we looked at this award and we looked at libraries for this award, we specifically were looking for how public libraries reach out into their communities. How do they make new connections? How do they establish new ways of, of talking with and engaging with their community? So we asked a lot of questions of applicants and our elected member leaders, and we were looking for some very specific criteria, criteria like innovation, impact, and reach. Innovation, right? We would ask, is it new? Has it been done before? How widely adopted is it? Or impact, right? What were the demonstrable results? Or can you see a return on investment? Is it quantifiable? And then reach. Reach is, is really important. You know, I think about different quotes, and the Martin Luther King Jr. quote that really says, life's most urgent question, right? What are you doing for others? And that is about reach, impact, and innovation. Does this program connect to new or traditionally underserved communities? So that's really important. And then we asked our member leaders to, to rank all the criteria. We combined the results because we didn't want it to be solely about new programs. And we wanted to make sure that both large and medium and small libraries all had an equal opportunity to be highlighted. And those three things are what has brought our three winning library programs here today. So when members of the America Regional Council, America's Regional Council did the rankings, Using those criteria, these three libraries rose to the top. That was a very close decision. And I have to tell you, in reading through all the entries, it's inspiring. It is inspiring. We have to find a way to, to be creative and share some of that great work because it is really incredible to see all of the variety of ways that public libraries are reaching their communities. But today, I want to find out a little bit more about our winners. So let's start with Tony Arango, instructional designer from Orange County Library System. He'll be telling us about the Orlando Children's Business Fair and he is joining us I think from Orlando I believe where uh, the weather is always perfect. Maybe there's a 15 minute rain in the afternoon but it's always really really great. So Tony? Hello, Skip. Thank you so much for having me. It is great to be with you. Uh, it's funny that you should mention, uh, I was going to make reference to the sunny and almost perfect weather here in Orlando, but we are experiencing quite the storm outside right this moment. Uh, but yes, it is usually uh, nice and sunny here. Um, hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here with you and to join these wonderful libraries and all the, uh, in recognition of all the excellent work that they do. Um, I have the privilege of being a part of the Technology and Education Center at the Orange County Library System in Orlando, Florida. Uh, our team uh, supports the library's technology and education program, uh, which focuses on presenting technology and fiber art classes to students of all ages and skill levels. Next slide, please. In 2017, uh, we introduced a series of courses we called Biz Kids. These classes introduced kids ages 6 to 14 to the worlds of business and entrepreneurship. BizKids participants learn to create a business plan and budget, uh, marketing collateral, as well as how to pitch their business idea to a potential investor. 
Along the way, they also learn important life skills, such as critical thinking, communication, and collaboration skills. After a successful launch of that program, uh, we were inspired to take our students further in their experience. Uh, we wanted to create a, a space where they could safely and comfortably put into practice the skills they learned in Biscuits, an event designed specifically for youth. And this led us to start what we think is a first in the country at libraries, the Orlando Children's Business Fair a one-day marketplace that showcases youth-run businesses in our community. Next slide, please. The fair challenged participants to create a product or service, develop a brand and marketing strategy, and then ultimately launch their business. This was a challenge that was enthusiastically accepted and embraced, not just by participants, uh, but by the entire family. Uh, and this was actually one of the more notable aspects of the experience to me. Uh, together, as a family, they worked to prepare and organize everything they needed to launch their business at the fair. Uh, the fair, uh, we, we had one simple rule. Uh, while friends and family were invited to join and support, and they sure did, we wanted our young entrepreneurs to be the ones presenting their products and interacting with customers. We wanted them to have that experience. And each year, uh, we've simply been blown away by the creativity and ingenuity of participants. Uh, they set up shop. Uh, if you could think of a lively farmer's market, that's exactly what it feels like. They set up shop and they sell beautiful artwork, uh, handmade soaps, uh, delicious baked goods, uh, jewelry even, um, some made with clever materials like Legos. Uh, one year, one of the participants uh, made uh, very excellent jewelry with Legos. Uh, there was a specific uh, bow tie that really stood out to me. It was, was very tempting. But those are just some examples of the excellent ideas that were put forth by our participants. Each year we conclude uh, the fair with a small ceremony uh, to recognize and celebrate all participants. Our aim uh, is to encourage them to continue chasing after their dreams, believing in themselves and all they can accomplish with hard work and dedication. Next slide, please. Since launching uh, the Orlando Children's Business Fair, 121 youth-run businesses have been showcased at the fair and more than 1,900 community members have attended in support of our young entrepreneurs. Great support from our community. Next slide, please. Jeff Sandifer, founder of the Acton School of Business, one of the fair sponsors, said, today's youth are tomorrow's business innovators and leaders. The fair gives students uh, the opportunity to spread their entrepreneurial wings and get a head start on promising business careers. Next slide, please. Celeste, one of the fair's participants, she shared, this is one of the best memories I've had in my entire life, end quote. Since the fair, she's gone on to register a trademark, publish a book on Amazon, and support the work of nonprofits through her business ventures. Her mother shared that the fair helps young people realize that they are impactful, that they can make a difference in their life and sometimes in the lives of others. The Orlando Children's Business Fair has truly been an enriching and memorable experience for everyone involved. It's been rewarding to see participants leave the experience with a smile on their faces, uh, and yes, a few extra dollars in their pockets, but more importantly, to see them leave with a sense of empowerment and accomplishment. Once again, thank you, Skip, and thank you, OCLC, uh, for this great, great honor, and congratulations to the other libraries. And now a cheering, thunderous applause for Tony. Oh, we have people. We're socially distanced, but that <laughs> that is really terrific. And. Tony and Helen, you know, just come back up here for a moment. Absolutely. Let's just talk. We just want to, Tony, just uh, if we could, while we have you before the storm takes you out, hopefully uh, you're safely <laughs> inside the building. Just a few questions for you. And I love to see that creativity, the entrepreneurship of, uh, of so many people like that. And I'd love to know, what was the initial prompt? How did it get started? Where did the idea come from? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, we it, the Children's Business Fair started uh, or was prompted by the BizKids classes. And so uh, we part of what we do is we try to keep uh, our finger on the pulse of what the trends are and what the interests uh, in our community are. And uh, we started to see a great number of people like interested in the subject of entrepreneurship. Shark Tank uh, is a really great example of a program that is watched by many families. So we knew we wanted to serve that particular niche. And we knew that we wanted to reach uh, uh, maybe folks in our community that weren't uh, traditionally coming in for our more traditional services. Uh, so that inspired us to move into this space uh, and to introduce courses as well as experiences around the subject of business and entrepreneurship with a focus on young people. So Tony, I'll ask you this before asking Helen if she has a question. If you were on Shark Tank, uh, which host would you be? Are you Mr. That Wonderful? That, that, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go with uh, Mark Cuban. <laughs> okay, good. Sure. <laughs> Tony, I was struck as I was listening to this when you spoke about, I mean, this program not only reached young entrepreneurs and children and their parents, but you had over 1,900 community members involved in this. So I would imagine building this program was more than just building it for the 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 members of your community who were participating in it, but you're also kind of selling this, right, to the community as an entrepreneur. Can you speak a little bit about how you went about that and, and maybe some of the benefits that it had for your library? Absolutely. Um, so, so part of the experience was, of course, us uh, learning a bit more about the subject matter. And so that led us to establish relationships with existing community groups uh, that had a focus on supporting small businesses in our area. And so we were able to connect with them, uh, leverage their expertise uh, to organize the classes as well as this event. Uh, and they were uh, instrumental, I think, in getting the word out to their members and to the folks that they, that they reach. Uh, as well. Uh, but you're right. Um, we actually purposely scheduled this event uh, to coincide with our uh, weekly farmer's market. So we figured people were in the area uh, and they were uh, in the spirit of shopping, so to speak. And so we offered it uh, that uh, at the same time uh, and uh, we distributed flyers there. Um, and that was part, part of our outreach efforts there to uh, hopefully engage some of the folks that were coming to our area already uh, and into so coming into the library and to maybe sharing a, a different experience. Um, so that, those were two, two aspects that I think were, were unique to our experience with this program, reaching out to community leaders, business leaders, as well as uh, community uh, business uh, owners uh, and uh, leaders as well. Excellent. I have one follow-up question. It's more along the lines, this program did, did a lot to bring people together in a fair-like environment. And I'm just curious, as your library starting to plan for this coming year, and I assume you've had it since 2017, it's so successful it's going to continue, are you starting to think about different ways that you might be able to uh, continue this program if we are still in a similar situation as we are right now? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's uh, great that you uh, mentioned this. So we uh, uh, actually recently took a component of this experience, our BizKids Club, and we took that virtual. So we are actually currently meeting with about 80 young uh, entrepreneurs across our community right now, and we've had several different groups as well through uh, – technology. And so we're meeting with them. Uh, we are presenting the, the concepts uh, to them. They're working through their business plans. Uh, we're inviting business leaders uh, to come in and speak and inspire the young people. So um, uh, it hasn't really kept us from uh, doing this outreach. We may be limited in some aspects, but we're still able to reach our community and provide this uh, service that they uh, love so dearly. That's fantastic. Can't wait to hear more about that as your continued successes and hear from the other ones. That's great. And Tony, thank you so much for that. And congratulations. And we'll leave as a top secret whether you, um, since you said you were also um, playing Mark Cuban, whether you're running for president, we will keep that as a secret <laughs> reveal at another time. And uh, we will now uh, move on. So congratulations uh, so much. And we're going to move on to our next winner, which is Sarah Tackett, director of the Jackson District Library about her uh, Project Bridge. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much and thank you for this honor. Um, we've been really excited about this program and the effect it's had on our community and appreciate OCLC's um, recognition of it. 
Um, could have next slide, please. Our um, program started um, a few years before 2017, just kind of as seedlings of different programming. Um, we took an opportunity in, to apply for an LSTA grant um, that the Library of Michigan was offering um, in 2017 and ended up with um, the opportunity to pilot some new programs to serve our older adult population um, because of some Knowing that this was a growing population in our community and in our country, we really were looking at different ways to serve um, older adults. Um, we ended up with the five programs that kind of touch on all kinds of um, senses and um, ways to connect people to memories. Um, we wanted to focus our attention to folks with um, Alzheimer's and dementia, um, along with um, the general population. Um, we had a great opportunity to build our relationships and develop new relationships with many community partners, um, especially our Symphony Guild, um, the Department on Aging, our Disability Connection, and more. Um, a staff member here and a few staff members and some of our friends had had some experiences with um, family members and loved ones who were suffering um, from different these different issues. And so Jean Daly was really the um, person who was on staff at the time who was the impetus behind this grant and then also um, developing one of the program the programs along with that. Um, next slide, please. Um, the first program that we worked on through the pilot was Music and Memory, and this was in partnership with the symphony. They were very interested in the using music to um, help folks, um, seniors and, and folks with dementia and Alzheimer's to create a, a more relaxed environment for them. Um, so what we did was this was a program they had brought to us um, um, based on a program called Alive Inside, um, where some other research had been done to use music to kind of calm folks. So we ended up putting our kits together um, that these kits could be checked out from the library. They could be kept by however long anyone needed to keep them. Um, we used the iPod Shuffle um, that, and along with some really soft, comfortable headphones so that they wouldn't um, agitate anyone. Um, we also um, had a nice handy bag that could be clipped on a, a wheelchair or a walker or something too. Um, and then on the um, Shuffle, we blow, we would interview the um, the the participant or also could be a family member or caregiver to find out what kind of music that they really liked from their past or what they really connected with. Um, some of our kind of feel-good stories around this program were really, you know, the idea that people were calmer, so um, one of the goals was to maybe they would use less medication um, to keep them calm. Um, we also had some many members who, you know, it brought back, um, you know, memories of their loved ones. Um, one story was that uh, a, there was a lady who would pick, use her headphones and, and the music and, and dance with a picture of her husband um, who had passed. So um, just a really impactful program and a wonderful way for us to work with our um, symphony. Next slide, please. The Time Slips program is um, a trademark program that we um, work to bring to our community. And the idea is you use photos of everyday happenings or events, not anything that you have to remember or know about. Um, and then we worked with the groups to actually have them create stories around the photo, um, the picture. So they would um, create the stories together and we would transcribe them and then collect them and after a, a series of um, programs, put those together and give those back, um, the photo and then the story along with that um, so that it could be something they could refer to. It's something they helped create. Um, so give gives folks an opportunity to con continue to be creative um, in their as they're as they're aging. Um, and this is a program too that could be um, translated to a multi generational group, as you see in this picture. Um, but it could be you know done with with families and children too. So it's kind of a, a, a nice program to that that goes a d couple different directions for us. Next slide, please. Um, because many of the seniors um, are in in different facilities and different um, have different 
challenges to get to our regular library programs. One component of our um, project bridge was to take JDL or Jackson District Library on the road. Um, so we did this in a variety of ways, um, basically presenting some of the same kind of programs, of course, that we would do in our library within a senior facility. Um, combination of all kinds of different types of programs. Um, we use storytellers, music programs. We even have sent a puppeteer out. Um, a, there are a lot of good interest in any kind of a history program, um, local history in Jackson especially. Um, Jackson has uh, was the first prison in Mich the state of Michigan, so the history behind that um, prison and is, is a real, was a popular topic with those programs. Next slide, please. One of the um, next things that we worked on was um, what we call journey kits. And these are kind of an adventure in a bag um, where um, a, a caregiver, a presenter, um, a, or a staff facilitator could take these kits out, use them with a group of um, um, seniors to give them a kind of experience. Um, the, they're kind of a combination of the old bifocal kits, but with a little bit newer twist um, to them. And with permission of the bifocal folks, we kind of put together some of their kits in a little bit different way. Um, each of the kits has uh, stories or folk tales from different countries or different times. Um, it also has books on a different topic. The kits that are displayed here are travel kits particularly, so there's information on Poland or Japan. Um, they also have tactile items, so something that people can touch and feel. Um, the Poland kit has some um, salt from the salt mines in um, in Poland, and you can um, just when in holding them, then you can paste the salt on your fingers. Um, they also would include a recipe and a guide on how to present this program to a group of people. Um, and this too could be used by many by all ages. Next slide, please. Um, the last program we developed is the Connections Kits. Um, and this is take, this was actually the first program that we visioned um, long before the grant. Um, and this was based, kind of inspired by an article we had read in Hornbook Magazine about a children's librarian who was using picture books to read with her mother who had Alzheimer's. And just kind of the interaction she had of having something in front of them that you didn't have to remember what it was. You didn't have to know everything, but you could use the book and the pictures as a, you know, to inspire some connection. Um, and that was kind of the ins inspiration for the title, but just to really be able to connect again um, with folks. And we put these kits together um, in theme based, so they're, they're kind of topic based where there'll be four or five books. Um, some of them, as we developed the kits, new resources became available, so we were able to add those to the um, kits too. So there's some discussion cards um, and prompts on other resources that we were able to put in, in those kits. Um, next slide, please. Um, as part of our grant, we put together a toolkit that we have available on each of these programs that we can share with other folks um, and is available on our website. Um, we also really were excited about kind of creating those new and integrating our programs with our partners. Um, we piloted these programs in a lot of different community um, situations. Um, so we were trying to reach um, folks who are in senior centers, folks who are living at home. Um, so we worked with different um, partners and different marketing to kind of reach different populations in the community of, of seniors. Um, and for us, it was really a way to focus um, some of our programming and refresh some of our programming um, and really look at the ways we are offering library services out of the library. Um, next slide. For me, the the most exciting part of the program, too, is allowing people to experience music, to allow them to be continue to be creative, um, and then really find the ways that they can connect with their hopefully loved, you know, with their loved ones and the folks that they're caring for them, um, so that to hopefully have some enrichment in their life. Um, also, thank you.
Well, thank you, Sarah, and tremendous thunderous applause for Sarah and her <laughs> library um, virtually. And uh, Sarah, that's very, very important work in a community that, of course, is growing, memory, Alzheimer's, dementia. And I think particularly in the times that we're in, we have to be very cognizant of the groups that are isolated, and um, it's harder and harder to reach these groups. Uh, speaking personally, uh, my mother-in-law is in one of these assisted living places. You can't even get in. And it's extremely frustrating about the families and to the people who are dealing with memory issues and feel like they are abandoned. So this is very, very important work, even more so in the times that we're in. But uh, Sarah, I just am curious because I'm always amazed at librarians and the skill set. When I talk to a young person about becoming a librarian, they might have one view in mind, and yet what the reality of the job is so very, very different. The skills that are required to do librarianship in a, in a way the way you just described are very different, right? So how do you, pre did you find it um, a challenge, or how do, you, how do you really help the staff learn all these different skills that they need to pull that type of program off? Was that an issue for you at all? Um, as part of the pilot, we engaged with a um, social worker to help us um, through the development of these programs, knowing that those skill sets were more attuned to some of these populations we were working with um, that we were learning to work with. Um, so um, that part of it was very, um, it was new for us, um, and it, it brought a lot to the table for us. Very good. Helen, do you want to? Yeah, I have, I, I have a couple of questions, actually. But the one that sticks out, Sarah, is in the Project Bridge, it really was, I mean, you presented like five different projects that were all part of this greater holistic view of reaching out to these populations. And um, having worked in public libraries in the past, and I know many of our public libraries who are joined in, are looking for great programs and great ideas that they might be able to replicate and takeaways. You had five great things there, and I'm just kind of curious, as you looked at those five, were any one of them more wildly successful than others? And, and if so, do you know what, what that might be attributed to? Um, I think they each had their own set of um, success. Um, some have been up and running longer than others. The uh, Music and Memory and the Time Slips were very early programs that were developed. Um, but I think they do, like you said, we were trying to reach people in different places at different times and in different ways. So they are fairly ambitious in the whole pilot, the programs that we developed and piloted. And I would... I would guess I would encourage other libraries, it doesn't have to be presented this way. One of these programs could be very impactful in a community. Um, so looking at it that way, um, it just felt like this was an opportunity for us to um, do a lot and, and really be able to um, try to create some impact broadly in our community. Excellent, excellent. My one follow-up question to that is, you're definitely dealing with some uh, great relationships that you have with some community partners, probably retirement homes, assisted living facilities, but even you, you talked about reaching out just to family members and those that are homebound. I'm just kind of curious as you look at your, your staffing and how you do that, and it's maybe to skip your question, do you, have you integrated that into your overall library um, staffing, or do you have a specific department or individual individuals that help kind of build this specific program for uh, older age adults? Um, we have um, kind of coming alongside this grant program, we were um, actually developing a dedicated community engagement department or staffing. Um, so they kind of came alongside at the same time. So they're the ultimately responsible for the programming and moving it forward. But they actually also, a lot of our staff um, from different areas also help with delivering some of these programs. So it's not all being delivered by just a small group of people. It's um, really look, looked at as part of our whole um, offerings to the community. And we engage staff from different levels to help and assist with it. Excellent. Thank you. Well, fantastic, Sarah. Thank you for that great work of reaching across generational lines and, and engaging in a, in a great way. So I appreciate it. And our last guest today 
is Elaine Jones. She's manager of youth services from the Edmonton Public Library all the way in Alberta, Canada. And she's going to tell us about their Welcome Baby program. Elaine. Thanks, Kip. I'm actually delighted to say that it's sunny here today. So we're maybe not Florida weather, but we're, we're pretty close today. So I'm delighted to um, be here to tell you a bit more about the Welcome Baby program. I've been involved with Welcome Baby since 2013, so it's a real honor to uh, to give you some more detail and in-depth look at, look at it. And I'm also delighted to accept this award on behalf of EPL. We're very, very grateful for OCLC's recognition and support. Next slide. Welcome Baby aims to support families in building early literacy capacity at home, essential for developing a lifelong love of reading and a lifelong connection to learning. The first of its kind in Alberta, Canada, parents receive a free kit from the library at their baby's two-month immunization at nine public health centers in Edmonton. Um, the kit includes, you can see on your screen and, and here in front of me in the, in, um, in the window, uh, a board book. It includes a music CD with a download code for people who no longer use CD technology, um, early literacy information, and a tote bag. The information in the Welcome Baby Kit provides foundational tools for parents to incorporate singing, reading, talking, playing, and writing into daily activities. These practices contribute to the development of critical early literacy skills. In addition to the nine public health centers, this program is now reaching more vulnerable populations through the health center at the Enoch um, Cree Nation, which is a reservation without a public library, and through the neonatal intensive care unit at, at our three local hospitals, where all babies admitted receive this kit. Now, once, once families um, receive the first kit, they receive an invitation, and they can follow up and receive a second board book. Um, they get to choose the board book at that time and a rhyme booklet. Um, if they come into uh, one of the public library branches in Edmonton and sign their baby up for a, a library card. Uh, next slide, please. Welcome Baby is an investment in the community. Since 2014, over 57,000 babies have received a kit. In 2019, 73% of babies born in Edmonton received a kit enabling EPL to reach countless families who might not otherwise come into a branch or even known about the types of services we offered to, to anyone, not to mention babies. Uh, by leveraging ex established community health networks, EPL can have trusted health professionals communicate the importance of literacy in a child's development and position the library as a significant asset in children's literacy and literacy, sorry, and future health outcomes. The recent expansion of Welcome Baby into the NICUs, the neonatal intensive care units, has further magnified the impact of the program. Reaching babies shown to have high rates of language and of language delay and communication impairment. Many parents continue their relationships with the library by signing their child up for a library card and coming into EPL branches um, to put, uh, you know, to work through um, uh, with their child through programs. Um, since the launch of Welcome Baby, EPL has seen a 108% increase in children's membership, um, which for those under three, which is over 3,700 in 2019 and an 82.7% um, increase in early literacy class attendance um, in the targeted years. Um, and so that means that we rose from 77,000 approximately um, in 2013 to 141,095 in 2019. Next slide, please. Welcome Baby has transformed how EPL reaches and supports our community. 
It has provided meaningful and timely engagement opportunities um, to connect parents and families, nurses and frontline health workers, and volunteers, all of whom are critical to the success of this program. The Welcome Baby packages communicate to parents that babies and parents are valued and welcome in our spaces. Something you'd think would be obvious, but not all families are aware of. It opens the door to broader conversations and deeper connections with the library that will hopefully last for years to come. Welcome Baby provides opportunities for nurses to share positive personal experiences about the library. These can be particularly important to newcomer families who may be unfamiliar with public libraries at all and um, not understand the types of services that they offer. Um, EPL would not be able to execute the Welcome Baby uh, program without the support and hard work of volunteers. In 2019, 161 volunteer hours were spent uh, on kit preparation, at, while 98 hours were spent delivering kits to um, health centers and hospitals. EPL's volunteers are dedicated and unwavering. They are passionate about wel what Welcome Baby um, brings to the community and believe in the impact it has on babies and families. Next slide. This is a lovely photo of um, Dr. Amber Reichert, a neonatologist at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Edmonton, um, and she's handing the welcome baby package to a mom in the NICU. Um, Dr. Reichert uh, has been a wonderful supporter of EPL since the, uh, her hospital came on board. Um, she often shares the story about how the co collaboration with EPL is more than just the kit, um, how her, her team has really been enriched by the, um, by the early literacy training that they received from uh, our EPL librarian. And she thinks this is such a key component of the program, and she's not afraid to put her singing, singing where her heart is, kind of as a way of saying it. She um, learned a diaper changing song from one of our youth services librarians, and she sings it to demonstrate to other hospital staff how it can calm sick babies during destabilizing events like diaper changes. Next slide. Since the beginning of the Welcome Baby program, EPL has received invaluable support from nurses and frontline health care workers. EPL nurtures these relationships by seeking feedback regularly. And we liaise with health care workers and staff for ideas on how to improve the program. We're really keen on listening to what they think will improve it and what, what works and what, and what might need to change. So far, uh, feedback has been consistently and overwhelmingly positive. Most nurses indicate that the only improvement to Welcome Baby would be continued growth of the program so that it can reach even more families in the city. Next slide. Well, Elaine, congratulations. There's another round of thunderous applause for you. That is terrific work. Those statistics are really striking, the quantifiable metrics. And I'm curious, did you expect, how did those kind of turn out compared to what you expected? Was it higher, lower? Where was it on the scale of expectations? Well, I think, you know, we're always, we're always aiming for 100%. You know, we're, we're always trying to reach everybody, um, get every, everybody in our community involved, we believe in this program highly, we believe it's beneficial to families and to babies. Um, and so we'd love to reach everybody, but still, we've, we've been very proud of the results. Um, we think it, it's great, it continues to grow. Um, you know, we always have to invest in it. There's, you know, always new families and, you know, we're constantly uh, reaching out to new staff in, in the hospitals so that they understand the program and can promote it and uh, as well as in the public health uh, units. But uh, yeah, we, we're quite proud of the results we've achieved. 
It, it's amazing, Elaine. There's really are great statistics, having seen a lot of different programs. And I'm not even going to ask how many parents had another baby just to get back into the program. But I will turn <laughs> it back to Helen. Helen, you have well, a question. No, that's, a, that's, that's great, because we've been doing it now. I was thinking it, when you had initially launched it for several years. And one thing that I was struck when you were sharing is you really talked a lot about volunteers and how the volunteers really help drive this program in assembling the kits. And you, and you spoke a lot about um, even the nurses that are in the hospital or engaging with the babies. Can you talk a little bit about what, I mean, when you look at something at this level where you're trying to have such an impact to every single child born in, uh, in Edmonton, uh, speak a little bit about what that benefit of utilizing and engaging um, that volunteer force that you have and, and maybe if there was any type of special training you did to start to engage people as you started to kick up this um, particular project. Well, we, we definitely did training. You know, we, uh, we met with the, um, the nursing staff at each of those nine public health units, and we, we, we talked them through the kit contents. We talked them through library services. We, uh, we talked about early literacy and the benefits of, you know, singing to your baby and, you know, speaking to your baby. I mean, they... They, they weren't that hard to uh, convince, you know, I think they were already quite uh, on board, but some of them had, you know, maybe weren't library users themselves. So, so we had to invest in that training and we continue to invest in that just because as new staff um, come in as public health nurses and, uh, you know, just even even in their, their front office staff, we, we talk about the program with them as well. So, so we're really um, we're really aware that this program is an investment that we we have to continue to uh, you know nurture, and um, you know with the volunteers uh, themselves, the ones who pack the kits, the ones who um, who deliver the kits, we also make sure that we we really speak uh, thoroughly about the program with them so that they understand because they're they're our voice. As well, you know, they are out in the community. They are connection. They tell their friends. They're proud of the work they do for EPL. They, um, you know, they're they're proud of making a difference, and we want them to be our spokespeople as well. And you know, often when they're delivering the ones that deliver the kits in the hospitals and um, to the public health units, they are the they're the the voice of the program as well. So they need to to fully believe in it and understand and be able to. Great. Thanks, Elaine. I'm going to turn it back to Skip, but I have a little... One thing that I've observed in, in speaking with each of you and just hearing about these engagement programs is I'm really like in awe of how each of you approach community engagement, not just from engagement with your customers or reaching new populations, but it seems like every single one of you looked at that engagement also as a different opportunity to connect with volunteers, to connect with other senior centers, to connect with entrepreneurs in your community. And so you really have made it a, a very inspiring inspiring to me, and I'm sure inspiring to many others, to think about community engagement on so many levels. So um, I'm going to just say congratulations to the three of you and turn it back to Skip. Thanks, Helen, and thank you all. Congratulations on these awards, and thank you to all the participants who uh, submitted just a wide variety of incredible ideas that are inspiring to us and inspiring to the community. It's something I talked to, as I, I mentioned, I have the great uh, fortune to work for uh, John Zabo as our board chair at OCLC, who runs the very small uh, library in uh, Los Angeles, and they do great work. But we're always talking about all the different programs and the ideas and the inspiration that comes from uh, libraries all over the world. So thank you for the work you and your staff are doing. It's so important. It really highlights the values of innovation, impact, and reach. That's what defines community engagement, and never has community engagement been more important than now in the times we're in when people feel isolated and disaffected and we need to reach out to them. So again, thanks to all the libraries who submitted such amazing, great projects. Congratulations to the winners. And we will have one more thunderous applause for you. Thank you so much.